welcome to the impact of moving over to Office 365 webinar presented by the USISA user group. My name is Lorraine Barclay from St George's University of London and I will be hosting and facilitating today along with Annette Webb from York St John's University. So Annette, can you hear me? Do you want to say hello? I can, Lorraine, yes. Hello, Lorraine, and hello, everybody else. Okay. So um, today we've got a really, we've got a packed one hour session as we're going to be joined by our guest speakers, John Donaldson from Newcastle University. Say hello, John. Hello. Okay. Hi, John. Thank you. And also Daniel Bird from St. George's University of London. Do you want to say hello, Daniel? Uh, good morning, everybody. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So they'll both be sharing their experiences of rolling out Office 365 at their institutions. And each experience will be followed by questions that have been pre-submitted from yourselves at registration. So, um, you're all welcome to pose questions if you want to through the IM chat on the left hand side as Annette and myself will be looking um, or keeping an eye on the conversations going there. These questions will be um, added to a, a Q&A that will be published on the USISA website as well as on our training community pages. All right, and in the second half of this webinar, Annette will be facilitating a discussion amongst different types of users. Um, well, when I say users, I mean Office 365 users from various universities. This will give us a user perspective from a trainer, staff members and a student. So before we start, can I go through some housekeeping with everyone? Um, what we're going to do, we're going to start with a quick little icebreaker and I think, Annette, are you going to put a little map up there for me? Yeah, I'm just um, finding the whiteboard one. There we okay, go. wonderful. Okay, so we've got a map of the UK. And what I would like you all to do is to just take a pen, all right, any colour that you like, as long as it's not pink, and um, place a dot where your physical location is on this map. So we can just gauge to see where our audience is based. Okay, so I can see somebody in Yorkshire. Oh, oh, I think people are moving this up and down and the dots are, okay. Are the dots moving, Annette? Yeah, they're looking good. We're getting yeah. a few dots on there. Okay, lovely. They're all over. It's national. Oh, there's some down on the bottom on the uh, southern coast. I'm very jealous. I wish I was down there. That's great. We've got a real mixture here. Okay, lovely. Um, I'm a bit worried that people have been moving the map and the dots aren't actually um, <laughs> where they're supposed to be. But as oh. you can see, there's a mixture. We're all over the place. <laughs> okay, fantastic. All right, so um, what we're going to do, we're going to move on. And what I'd like to do is invite John Donaldson. Um, who has played a major role in provisioning Office 365 at Newcastle University to share with us his experience. So, John, are you ready? I am indeed. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is John. I work as an infrastructure systems administrator at Newcastle University. Um, I project managed our uh, migration to Office 365 for students, uh, currently doing work to look at moving stuff to. And it's really to talk about our experiences. Um, the project inception uh, dates back to 2011. Um, we were one of the first um, universities to move to Office 365. Um, we bypassed looking at live at EDU and had an Exchange 2007 service on premises where we had about 20,000 active student mailboxes with a 150 megabyte quota. Um, and it was a time where we had to decide on what to do next. And Live at EDU was being replaced by Office 365, so we saw that as an opportunity to look at some cloud provision for, um, for uh, student email. Um, when we were looking at it, um, Office 365 came out in about January of 2012, and we had a deadline of summer 2012 and the next academic year to get everything going. So it was a bit of a, a time pressure situation where 
you know, this was the opportunity to do it, and um, quite a bit of work went into to getting to that stage. Our staff and research postgraduates uh, were using Exchange 2010, and we'd been using Active Directory um, since its inception in 2000, so it was quite a mature installation we had of that. Um, the decide to move to the cloud, um, primarily born by, it seems to be a trend in the industry, um, avoid large capital expenditure and a recurrent expenditure at that, offer a huge mailbox quota far in excess of what we were offering locally. Um, but also to look at adding value applications. So we did, we saw it on the horizon as being more than an email service or a cloud email service. And with the, the look to link and um, SkyDrive as it was at the time, now OneDrive, um, you know, we thought it a good, good decision to make. Um, the Green Agenda also helped. Um, there's been quite a, a push at the university for reducing carbon emissions and uh, spending less on electricity and spinning all those disks in the data centers, something we wanted to try and avoid too. Um, so why did we decide Office 365 and why not Gmail or, or another? Um, Sorry, looks like my presentation has just disappeared. Um, so because we run on-premises exchange for staff and post-grad research students, um, we wanted to continue um, the sharing abilities for those, the fact that you know it was a unified address book between the two services that we could. Um, easily move mailboxes um, between the systems. We have quite a regular occurrence of students becoming staff and staff becoming students. So to try and streamline, streamline that, we thought Office 365 was a good good fit, but also because of the technical experience. Um, because we were running Exchange on-premises, um, Office 365 is like running Exchange in the cloud. It's, it's, it, it's very similar, it's the same. And also the fact that students had a familiarity with Outlook Web App and Office applications. And so we thought Office 365 was the best fit in that circumstance too. But also looking at on the horizon of what we were going to do with staff email. And, and you know, we thought moving staff away from things they're familiar with would be a much harder sell than students. Students seem to be much more pragmatic when it comes to um, IT, so um, that was definitely in the back of our minds too. Um, so from a preparation perspective, um, we had a, a desire and actually a remit to provide some form of single sign-on. Um, and because we had the mature Active Directory infrastructure using ADFS, we had the ability to do that. Um, we did a lot of work on deciding whether we wanted to put subdomains in the way. So um, student.newcastle.ac.uk is an example. Um, and also a lot of work going on to uh, how we would, or what we would do with mail routing, whether we wanted everything just delivered to Office 365 or whether we wanted to route email through our um, on-premises systems so we could maintain consistency with uh, spam and AV for example, how we would work directory synchronization, how we would get the ADFS working with Microsoft, that was quite a bit of a task. Um, but also the logistics of moving so many users in such a short period of time. Uh, the issue with Office 365, there was a, a limitation of um, being able to move attachments larger than 25 megabytes in mailboxes. So there's quite a bit of work that went into uh, working around that and, and diagnosing who those users were going to be to minimize the impact they would have in the migration. And lastly, um, I'm sure we're all aware of, you know, universities being at the, the cutting edge of uh, BYOD challenges and having to do testing on uh, a plethora of different devices and different, you know, I think Microsoft had done a, a huge amount of work in, in sorting that out, but at the time, it was very, very patchy. Um, and also because um, we went without any consultancy of any kind, there was a lot of learning in-house that went on, a lot of testing, a lot of figuring out how things worked to to do the 
the the migration. Um, likewise, Microsoft manage expectations for your documentation. Um, it it solves that issue. Um, and to be honest, with students, since we've had it in over two years now, the number of problems has been very minimal indeed. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that the problems won't arise with staff because of the much more complex um, way of working they have. Yes. But for students, it's been it's been great. Okay. So, how much work did you need to do on the staff side to control the license allocations? Um, so, new starters and leavers. Sure thing. Um, as we were one of the first on Office 365, we've been through several different license SKUs and moving licenses around has been awkward. Touchwood, it's been settled down for a little bit now. Um, or at least Microsoft seemed to be automating stuff. I noticed that um, we've recently changed to a, from an A2 to an E2 license, but um, we haven't had to do anything on the back of that, really. Uh, with, regran with regards to the granularity of features applied, I think it could be easier than it is. So, for example, if you have Exchange enabled, but then want to add a link or OneDrive, it requires a little work scripting-wise to be able to turn things on and off. Mm -hmm. Having PowerShell ex scripting experience is a huge plus, um, but I think that's true of managing Exchange anyway. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I've got just one more question mm -hmm. before we uh, move on to Daniel. Um, in the past, all right, somebody posed this question. In the past, I have had situations where some students choose to auto forward their university email accounts to their pre existed email account, which means yep. they then skip or are unaware of the calendar functionality. Have you encountered this? Yeah. Yes, um, we don't actually prohibit this. Um, and, and when this question was posed, I ran a report to see how many students are doing it. And there's about 1,500 students that are doing it. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, students come to university with a plethora of different email addresses and mechanisms of communication anyway. So I think you have to be a bit pragmatic that students are going to read that email in many different ways. And it's not really for us to dictate that. I think it's still important that we provide a mailbox on premises. It's a mechanism of you know, assuring something's been delivered should there be a dispute and also being able to maintain a consistent email address. So if students were just providing a Hotmail or Gmail address to student services and then they changed that but didn't keep it up to date, um, you know, we wouldn't have that guarantee that it was getting to an end point. Whether they forward that on after that's really their own business. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to calendaring, um, I wouldn't say many students use it, but that's purely an anecdotal, um, you know, experience. Uh, I don't think this is any de anything detrimental because of Office 365, and um, because students had the inbuilt coloring when we were using Exchange on premises. Okay. Um, I just think they have their own way of doing things. Maybe they have a, a Google Calendar or, or whatever. Um, and to be honest, I think we're maybe losing a bit of functionality there, particularly with you know, staff and student interactions with regard to booking, you know, mental time or um, or things like that. Mm -hmm. And But one thing that we do suffer with and one thing we're looking to try and fix is, you know, getting um, timetable information into Exchange, but we've run into some problems with that. So oh, okay. That I, sounds I, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. We use Silver's Plus for timetabling and getting that information directly into uh, exchange so students can then you know use it mm -hmm. because of the frequency of timetabling changes we haven't found an ideal way of doing that okay. so what we do currently is just provide a you know a internet calendar subscription and students use that rather than it being anything specific to do with office 365 or exchange okay um, well um thank you very much john for your experience um i'm sure you. i'm sure a lot of people have um, got a lot of I got a lot out of it, um, but what we're going to do now is we are going to move on to Daniel Bird from St. George's University to give his experience of rolling out Office 365. So, Daniel, are you there? Yes. Uh, okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'll just switch to my presentation and hopefully um, some of the problems that I'm seeing coming up on the left will be resolved. Okay, so... Um, as I said, good morning, everybody. Um, name's Daniel Bird. I'm Network and Systems Manager for St. George's University of London, um, project and technical lead for our Office 365 uh, deployment. 
Um, before I start, I just need to make you all aware I'm actually presenting this from home. So if you hear a baby crying, dogs barking, or builders banging, I apologise in advance. So um, a little bit of history to start with. Um, SQL historically ran most of its uh, mail and calendaring services on non-Microsoft infrastructure um, way back in 1998. A uh, collaboration platform from the Sun Netscape Alliance. Uh, software portfolio was installed. This utilized LDAP messaging, calendaring um, from their software suite and was deployed on Sun Microsystems hardware. Uh, over the following years, the product was renamed various times, underwent multiple architecture changes, uh, ownership changes, and is now owned by Oracle. And it's called Oracle Communications Unified Communications Suite. Why the what use of communications twice? I don't know. But um, so, as I mentioned, over the years we've we've performed many upgrades, and on actually more than one occasion had to do a complete rebuild of the system. Uh, end user clients were typical, typically Thunderbird or its own webmail, which is currently called Convergence. Um, to achieve the functionality required by our administrative departments, which was mostly calendar and contact sharing via Outlook, uh, we needed to deploy, deploy uh, a connector. Uh, this connector was provided by Oracle. Um, it provided limited uh, collaboration functionality, um, and it's far from ideal. And actually, what we found was the, the support overhead was extremely high. Um, of course, we didn't just have to deal with Outlook. Um, SQL has a relatively open policy for mail client choice. Um, we allow our, our members to use whichever mail user agent they prefer, of course. Um, that brings about its own challenges, but I don't think I have time to go into that. Um, so why did we move to Office 365? Well, um, as I mentioned, there was a lot of, um, a great deal of, of the institution used functionality of, of Outlook um, and it quickly became clear that the, the connector wasn't fulfilling all of uh, that functionality so we needed to move to Exchange. Um, again in line with many other universities we didn't have or don't have uh, the required funds to do this on premise so um, Office 365 gave us the ability to, to not have to uh, provide capital and reduce our current costs over existing uh, installation. And being cloud-based, we obviously didn't need to invest in hardware. Um, our existing infrastructure was getting rather long in the tooth and was uh, heading for replacement anyway, along with the storage platform. And the age of the kit meant that the current costs for maintenance were increasing. At the same time, our mailbox count was increasing, meaning our maintenance charge for uh, the, the existing platform, uh, software maintenance charge for the existing platform was increasing. So choosing Office 365 meant that we could remove those costs altogether. Um, I've put in here that uh, negating the need for consumer grade collaboration tools. I'm presuming many of you face the same challenges we do with uh, products like Skype and Dropbox. Um, there's a lot of concern around the end user license agreements of these products, their mode of operation, and more importantly, their security. So Office 365 with Link and OneDrive offers us the chance to provide these services within the bounds of our institutional policies. Um, we had spent time investigating alternative pro uh, products to fulfill these roles. However, many didn't live up to expectations or simply couldn't scale to the number of users that we required. Um, Again, storage and management costs are storage costs and management costs are reduced. Things like backups we didn't need to do anymore. Um, no longer did we man need to manage user quotas or actually provision additional disk capacity or, or plan for that change. So obviously, moving to Office 365 um, helped um, in that respect, and, and obviously gave our sysadmins a, a little bit um, bit more of a breather. Um, cloud services obviously are becoming quite ubiquitous. Um, 
seems a bit of a throwaway comment to say follow the trend, but it's an important factor because um, the stability of these cloud services and the feature sets are now surpassing what we can achieve on premise. And there's a reason for the trend, in that obviously customers and people want the features that are being deployed. So if we ignore it, there's a chance we get left behind. Um, as I mentioned, Link and SkyDrive, uh, sorry, Link and OneDrive are additional features that we gain for free, if you like, um, when deploying Office 365. But it's not just about the software, it's about what you do with it. And as John alluded to in his, in his presentation, there's many use cases for these, these softwares that, that can bring huge benefits to the institution. Um, along with that, obviously, we have strategic partners like many institutions these days. And over 70% of our strategic partners are already Office 365 tenants. And last but not least, um, the Janex Cloud Services Agreement became available during the period that we were looking to deploy a cloud-based email or collaboration system. Um, at the time, uh, the only one that was available was Office 365, I believe. Uh, Google Apps for Education is, is now available as well. So if anyone hasn't yet moved to Office 365 and is thinking to do so, um, it's worth looking up. It saves a lot of time and effort um, in terms of uh, legal obligations and due diligence. So our challenge was um, that we had no existing exchange skills, no existing PowerShell skills. Um, obviously, as I mentioned before, we, we weren't a Microsoft shop, so um, we were going to need to learn this. Um, we also had a platform where Microsoft didn't acknowledge, or still doesn't acknowledge, exists. So um, the migration from, from the existing platform to uh, Office 365 was going to have to uh, be done by ourselves. We decided early on that we wanted to deploy pretty much all of the Office 365 suite, so uh, Exchange, in, in Email and Calendaring, OneDrive, and Link. We also needed to ensure that we maintained um, end user device configurations to their existing IMAP um, mailbox. This is primarily driven by the, by the fact that we don't have uh, a support department capable of, of dealing with um, the sheer volume of calls we would expect if we didn't do this. And of course, no downtime is, is part of the course these days. Um, but it also became clear that um, during the pre-rollout stage, of this, my, the migration was going to happen just before clearing and, and you know, a couple of weeks before the start of term. So any downtime during that period um, simply wouldn't be tolerated. Painless migration was something that um, we hoped to achieve. Obviously, given that we're not an exchange shop, um, the facilities for migrating uh, users to Office 365 within Office 365 um, are not available to us. So um, we had to come up with a roll your own hybrid deployment scenario. Um, we were well aware that this would uh, provide some, well not provide, there would be some pain during migration purely and simply because we didn't have the tools at hand provided by Microsoft, but um, we felt it was a chance worth taking. So how did we do it? Um, we basically needed to have both systems coexist at the same time and users provisions on both sides. Um, of course, both of those systems believed that they were authoritative for our email domain. Um, and we needed to find some way to get email from one system to another. Um, this is where we used alias subdomains. So um, each system, Office 365 and our on-premise system, had its own alias subdomain to all users that we could use to route email backwards and forwards between the two systems. Um, open source to the rescue. Well, this is. Um, something that was, was rather fortunate actually because as I mentioned earlier we, we spent a lot of time over the years migrating and upgrading, upgrading our on-premise uh, mail system and a number of these things were already in place. Uh, the petition IMAP proxy for example we used 
previously to uh, root or root IMAP connections between various servers for staff and students. Um, Perl and LDAP, well LDAP was leveraged by the existing mail system to hold all the user settings. Perl was used to script all of the all of the changes with LDAP. Uh, Exim, send mail replacement, uh, a lot of universities use that. And um, But the key here is really um, MySQL, PHP, Apache, and IMAP Sync. Uh, those, those four things allowed us to hold the state of user migration, um, their licensing information, that sort of thing, where they were in, in the migration process, so whether they were licensed or whether they were finally migrated to Office 365. And um, of course, IMAP Sync was uh, something that we used to actually copy email from one system to another. Um, PowerShell for Dummies I've put there is uh, essentially us spending a lot of time using Google and <laughs> learning how to use PowerShell. Um, it was uh, obviously we've come from a Unix background, so um, PowerShell was uh, was a little bit difficult to get our head around at, at the start, but um, I think we got there in the end. ADFS and Azure Directory Sync. Well, these two obviously. Um, play an important role, as John mentioned earlier, within Office 365, so ADFS for authentication, um, Azure Directory Sync for uh, synchronizing our on-premise Active Directory into Office 365 and making the users available. Um, those were, were quite challenging, actually, uh, ADFS especially. Uh, as John mentioned earlier, there was a, there's an issue around uh, the user principal name and the email address within Office 365 having to match. So that's something that we, we needed to spend a lot of time uh, investigating. We also use Office 365 Smart Links. Um, I think that's some terminology that Microsoft invented to basically describe a glorified re redirect. However, what it allows us to do is, is present a uh, a nice looking URL to the end user for, for web based access. Um, and then, of course, we needed to provide some way of, of copying email from the on premise server to ex uh, Exchange in the cloud. Um, and unfortunately, because we don't have the same privileges in uh, Exchange as we would do on premise, um, we needed to ask our users for their username and password, something that we say we would never do. But unfortunately, in this case, it was um, unavoidable. So, <laughs> don't worry, I'm not going to explain this this uh, this slide. Um, it's just really there to show you the level of complexity that we ended up with um, in allowing both of our systems to coexist at the same time and mail to uh, route between them freely. Um, and of course, that level of complexity led to some issues. Um, UPN versus email addresses I've already mentioned. Um, the next three are actually um, artifacts of, of moving to Exchange in the cloud or Office 365. So Active Directory sync delays, not delays as such, but um, the, the synchronization between Active Directory on-premise and Active Directory in the cloud is scheduled. So um, changes can take anywhere up to three hours to propagate. Um, directory synchronization errors, Office 365, is um, not tolerant of uh, duplicated email addresses, be they uh, aliases or primary email addresses. New mailbox provisioning delays, well, they, that actually comes around from, from the licensing perspective. Um, so once the user is licensed, an exchange mailbox is then provisioned. Um, our experience, that seems to be a random number up to 10 minutes. Um, that's why we need to hold the state of the user migration in a, in a database somewhere um, before we make additional changes and licensing changes. Um, mail forwarding loops obviously a big issue. We, we mentioned these subdomains and forwarding mail backwards and forwards between two systems. Obviously, if we get that wrong, um, there can be significant impact on not just uh, the user provision, but our on-premise mail system. So we had to find some way of preventing those. Um, license scenarios, as I said before, that, again, sometimes these just would not uh, take. So you would assign a license and it, it, the, the, the user object in Office 365 wouldn't take on, on the appropriate license or the mailbox wouldn't be provisioned. So those are some of the things um, that we, we you know, really struggled with at the start, but finally got our head around. Um, 
Shan, can yes. I can I interrupt? We're yeah. running out of time. Okay, okay. so um, I'm not going to um, get a chance to ask you questions. We're going to have to move on. Mm -hmm. um, could you just sum up in say like a, a minute? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No problem. So our uh, mail migration consisted of around 25,000 students which we migrated in in 12 hours over one weekend we did not mail great them email for them so that as I mentioned before there was a, a an IMAP or a, a synchronization copy provided system provided so and to date 3,000 or so students have transferred their mail um, and we licensed all of the students for Pro Plus 2013 um, and if anybody's unaware if you have a campus agreement uh, Microsoft will provide you with those licenses for students um, just a quick post-mortem so we had some students which were off-site or remote um, of course they never log on to our Active Directory domain um, these require password resets because of course our password policy from Active Directory was re replicated into Office 365 we had some users which um, had confusion over their email address um, and or logging didn't know what to which one to use um, share mailboxes because they were different on our existing system um, were and still remain to some degree problematic um, and we also have issues around ADFS and SSO um, historically users used to log into multiple mailboxes from from the desktop uh, via a web browser and or a mail client and of course uh, ADFS and SSO prevents that um, Staff migration. We're, we're currently we've currently migrated roughly a hundred staff. Um, we've done a lot of work around uh, pre-migration on the desktop, so upgrades to Office, uh, deployment of Link, deployment of OneDrive, and, and various other things. Um, and I won't cover training. Uh, I'll cover further ahead. So as of first uh, of December 2014. Uh, Microsoft will be providing us with uh, Office 2013 Pro licenses for staff. So this is this is a big change. It means that um, they'll be able to use five desktop or five mobile device licenses at home. Um, we will be looking to change our RMX records to point to uh, Office 365 in the near future. Once uh, once we've got all our users over, um, we will need to spend some time on Link and OneDrive advocacy. Uh, to address the issues I mentioned earlier regarding uh, Dropbox and Skype and the like. And there's some additional things there, but I think I'll leave it there given that we're running out of time. Okay, thank you very much. That was wonderful. All right, so um, what I'd like to do is I'm not going to ask you any questions, so I'm just going to just sum up that um, you can see there's two different types of experience um, we just heard, all shaped by the previous existing mail provision. Um, you, you had one that was quite simple. I think that was John's one and a more complex one, um, and that's if you're coming from a non-Microsoft Exchange server infrastructure, and that was Daniel. So what I'm going to do now is move on swiftly and um, pass um, the mic over to Annette. Hi. All right, who's hello, Annette? Hi, Lorraine. Hi. Could you turn your volume up, please? Because I we yeah. don't seem to be able to hear you. Is that better? Um, a little bit louder, if you can, as loud as you can. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll speak louder. You'll shout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, so we're now going to be um, having a discussion with four people that have used Office 365 and these are from different perspectives. So we have Adam who is um, a researcher uh, at St George's University of London and we've got uh, Robert who is um, the head of AV at St George's uh, University of London. We've also got Jane Hetherington who is IT trainer at Leeds University and um, Dimal Patel who is the head of students union at St George's University of London and he is here from the students perspective. So um, glad I'm glad that the volume is better Ronnie, thank you for that feedback. Hey! Okay so I really apologise for that. Um, okay, so uh, some questions you'll see on the slide. 
Uh, I'm going to ask firstly um, Jane what sort of training was needed. So Jane, if you could um, come in on the conversation, that'd be brilliant. Hi, hi, Annette. Um, I apologise for my uh, dulcet tones this morning because I'm a bit of a got of a cold at the moment, so <laughs> I apologise for that. But um, from a training point of view, um, I was asked to deliver training to members of staff at the University of Leeds, not students. Basically, it was the IT support staff, so that if we got questions from students, people would be comfortable with answering them. And the training that I delivered was uh, in a webinar format, and I did 10 sessions, all online, and it was just to give a, a familiarisation session of how the Office 365 email would work for students. So it was getting comfortable with all the features, all the facilities, and we also had some dummy accounts set up so that people could go away from the webinars and actually have a go and practice with these dummy accounts to see how things worked. From that, what we were trying to achieve was sort of the kind of questions that maybe students would ask, staff would ask, so we could then put things on the website as a, like a frequently asked questions page so that people could uh, sort out any problems that they were having there. Now the webinars that I delivered were around about an hour and a half. And I got some really good feedback. IT people love being online. <laughs> so they did go down really well. And I did enjoy running them and I recorded them so people who couldn't attend uh, could actually watch them after the fact as well. Um, I have run workshops as well, just in case people wanted to come and have a practice again, because um, as you may know, not all IT staff are IT literate as such, uh, and some of sort of like office staff things like that, they prefer to be in a classroom environment, so I did do workshops as well as the webinars. Does that sort of help with the kind of training that I did there? Yeah, definitely, Jane. That was really useful. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so uh, Robert, how was your experience with um, Office 365 being the head of AV? Did you find that um, you had any difficulties in moving over? Uh, no, we didn't actually. Uh, Lorraine came in with a nice big bright smile one morning and said, how about going over to the 365? So I said, what's 365? Anyway, that passed and uh, a couple of weeks went past, came in, IT switched everything over and we've got a team of seven people because we run a television studio as well. And I found, uh, generally we, all of us found, but personally speaking, I found the switch over extremely easy. Um, That's good to hear. Yeah, we had a little calendar problem but then our IT gurus sorted that out within a week or two so we got our calendars back and from there on it's been smooth sailing. I have a Mac user as well as a PC user so I use OWA, find that extremely good and what I do like is being able to just move from work to the laptop to home and you're just in the same environment. You can use the OneDrive, you can use you know which is really easy rather than going through any FTP storage and all the rest of it, or trying to lose your USB. Um, you know, it's just there. So... Um, That's good. And, and how, how did you feel that Office 365 compared to uh, another email uh, type like Hotmail or Gmail? Well, I'm not a Hotmail user, only till recently. Um, I've had to use it a couple of times with an outside organisation. I was using Thunderbird and um, across both platforms, Mac and PC, that was working. But now this has a lot more advantages. There's a few more buttons you press to do something. I still haven't quite got together with all the shortcuts, but that's not really holding me back. Um, and no, the, the switchover was fine. Thunderbird switchover, there, there, there wasn't, shall I say, there wasn't much difference. You know, basically as an end user, you could see all your folders on one side, yeah. Mail's in the middle and you read them on the right. That's in, in simple terms, that's how I used to work and still do. Um, so no, the, end, the end fine. user experience, sorry to interrupt, but the end user experience is, is good and you would re recommend it? Yeah, absolutely smooth. And I'm not being paid to make that comment. It is actually really smooth switchover. I was really pleased. 
Oh, th thanks for that, uh, Robert. Um, I've just seen uh, Jerry put a message in the instant messaging um, that at Bradford they had floor walkers from IT support. That sounds really useful, actually. Um, I think that that's invaluable. I think just face-to-face -face contact. I, I'm still a great believer in that as well as stuff online. Um, and I see that uh, Bristol did something similar. Um, they actually employed 30 students, as you'll see in instant messenger. That's um, that's very useful. So thanks for those comments, guys. Um, I'm going to move on to Dmail. So Dmail, if you could unmute yourself and give us um, your sort of um, thoughts on being a student or being uh, head of students union. Um, did you find uh, that it was an improvement to what you had before? Did you have any difficulties? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. It was a it was a good move. Um, we were the first student at Spatel office. We were the first students to be moved over um, to Office 365. And for the last three years that I've been here, we've been using as convergence. And as as Robert just said, um, I'm a Mac user as well, and so are many of our students. And it's it's good that the interface is is the same basically, so you can go from your PC straight to your Mac. Um, in terms of moving over, our IT department were very helpful. They came up did everything for us, moved it over. Um, in terms of support, if anything we needed to do, for example, we I have shared inboxes as well, so I know Dan said there's there's some problematic things with shared inboxes, but they're very helpful in making sure that works in um, Office 365. Um, I'm not the most tech savvy person in the world, but um, it didn't really require much training either. It's, it's quite self-explanatory. It's um, got quite a nice user interface, um, and it allows us to to go on and use it quite well, and I think it's been a good move overall. Great, right. Th thanks, Dima. We've got a question coming through. Um, how did you find the mobile experience? How would, um, the University of Bristol students tend to be Android or iOS. Yeah. Um, so, did you find it was okay to use it on mobile devices? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, we just used it, the uh, our office uh, mobile site, and uh, I use it on my iPad as well as my phone. Um, if I'm not in the office or from abroad, um, and I think it's as I said, the layout is very good because it's all the yeah. same wherever we wherever you put it up, either on a Mac or an Android or a phone. So um, I think personally, I, all my devices are Apple, so <laughs> I'm yeah. not entirely sure on Android. Um, but in terms of uh, mobile devices, it seems to work very well as well. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for that, Dimal. Um, I'll now ask Adam uh, a couple of questions. So, Adam, um, from your perspective as a researcher at St George's University of London, um, do you like using it? I mean, I know that's a closed question, but um, I, I, you know, were there any negatives? It seems to be quite a positive debate. Uh, can you think of any negatives that people need to be aware of? <laughs> So you're asking me to be the bad guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the yeah. We're the good guys. You're the bad guy. Sorry. Um, I so I I kind of agree with what was previously been said. The kind of transition was very smooth, uh, it, almost transparent to the point. Um, so the, my real changes for me personally have been I changed email client from Thunderbird to Outlook, but I guess that's not necessarily Outlook 365. Um, <clears throat> in terms of devices, uh, it's all still works for that. Uh, as long as you've got IMAP, you can use it on any device, so it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, I, it's, in, in terms of <clears throat> email use, uh, I wouldn't, I don't really have anything negative to say at all. Really? Um, right. I've had some, we've had some problems with OneDrive, but those are probably technical difficulties which needs to be worked out. But um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I've got anything particularly negative to say. If that helps. Right, okay. Well, I've, I've tried my best to try and bring in <laughs> another side to it. Um, I hope we're getting commission here from uh, the um, from Microsoft for this. I think we, we deserve it. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming through. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, Fiona is asking, Jane, can you obtain attendance attention reports for attendees after your webinar? Yeah, hi Nettie. I was just going to respond in the uh, instant messenger there, but uh, seeing as all you've asked, um, <laughs> throughout the webinar, obviously I can see who's attending and who's in the chat pane and things like that. But as part of the webinar, about halfway through, I did actually get them to log in with the dummy accounts and I made them send me an email and I responded. So I actually got them interacting. So then I could actually see who wasn't taking part. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a little bit mean in that respect, you see, because I do get people to do stuff. Um, so I did get responses from everybody and this is what I told them at the beginning. I expected them to sort of participate. And 
they did find it useful so I didn't have any sort of uh, barriers to break down with getting people involved in that so that's sort of how I um, made sure that people were uh, um, participating and uh, joining in in there so I hope that answers Fiona's question. Thanks, Jane. Um, we've got a me uh, message here from Michael uh, that we've focused quite a lot on email. Uh, do any of the people in the discussion have anything to say about other core elements such as OneDrive or SharePoint? I, I would only repeat, I say we've had some issues uh, reliably re re syncing with OneDrive. Uh, right. But other than that, that's all I've really tried. So. Okay. This is Adam speaking, by the way. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks, Adam. Um, okay, so maybe a bit of work needs to be done on OneDrive um, initially. Um, I'm just looking at the messages. Uh, the Janet framework sounds very useful. Um, yes. Okay, uh, so anyone got any uh, anything to say about SharePoint? Um, look, can I just uh, mention something on the Janet Framework, if that's possible? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Um, it sort of relates to a previous question that was in the IM there about security. Um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you sign up to the framework, you, you get a draft copy that allows you to take to your institutional uh, lawyer and or uh, policy people to do some due diligence. Um, what you will find in there is that there's some additional provisions negotiated by Janet um, with regards to where your data is stored. Um, obviously in um, response to concerns over uh, US companies and the Patriot Act and those sorts of things. Um, so it's well worth getting in touch with uh, Janet to uh, get hold of that, get hold of a copy of that because you will find that most of the things that you're worried about will be addressed. Right, okay. Th thanks for that, Daniel. I think that might answer Jerry's question as well about privacy and security. Um, there's uh, a question here from Kevin. Uh, do people see a need to keep an on-premise exchange infrastructure uh, in case mailboxes need to be brought back from the cloud? Does anybody want to comment on that? Oh, John's said here. John's answered it. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, we because we still have exchange uh, for staff on premises. We have a hybrid setup that marries the two systems together, and moving mailboxes to and fro between them is very simple. When we move staff, the question will get raised is whether we still need that. Um, I think it's handy to have. Um, whether that's a much diminished, you know, uh, exchange setup, um, but just being able to, to do things like that or have that extra little bit of control, I think, is important. Um, that's so all I've to say about that. Thank you, thank you, John. Okay, well, I, I hope uh, that discussion's answered a few uh, questions. We probably could have done with a, a bit more time. I feel like I'm on question time when I say there's always time to uh, uh, to, to further the debate. But we needed will, another half an hour, didn't we? Annette? We do, we do, Lorraine. Um, there will be a question and answer web page on the USIZER website, and I'm sure that'll be made available to you all. Um, what I'd like to move on to now is a poll. Uh, we're going to be um, asking you um, if you can watch your screen to answer um, this question, please. And, and um, I'll give you sort of a few seconds to do that, guys. So if you all want to um, just answer one of those. <laughs> oh, the presenters did a good job. No pressure there. Is that you, Lorraine? No, I haven't done anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's great. <laughs> okay, so what we need to do, just save that. Okay, okay so I'm just going to um, save those results. And, um, okay, I'm going to save that there. And then I'm going to then go into the next question, which is um, going to be appearing any minute now. So if you could answer that as well, that'd be great. Okay, this is exciting. We could do with like drum roll music here or something. Bum, 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 or I could start singing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to save that. Okay, brilliant. So um, I'm just going to go to the next one. So about link online technology. Uh, 
Oh, let's okay. Dislike the limited technology. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> System kept crashing. Okay. I know that one. That happened to me. Never mind. Um, if this is really useful feedback, do appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so the final one now. Did you is... Save that one. Yeah, I did. Okay. I saved it. I saved it. Yeah. Okay. Did you enjoy the webinar and was it beneficial? And what I will like to say here as well is um, if anybody has any constructive, um, uh, con uh, <laughs> I'm just reading Criticism. Ian's message. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> um, if anyone would like to put anything in the messenger, then we can record it and, and look at it um, in our reflection, which I'm sure me and Lorraine will be doing. Um, that would be really good. So I'm just going to save those results. And uh, I think we're bang on time, which is great. Um, so we'd like to thank all our guests for yes, coming definitely. and for all of you who um, registered and took part. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. OK. Um, and keep your eye uh, on for I'm just um, sorry. I'm just saving those results. And um, I'm now going to go to the slides to find uh, details on the next webinar, which is in December, uh, which is on Wednesday the 3rd at 12 o'clock. Uh, this is quite an exciting um, webinar, if you can call webinars exciting. It will be, I promise. Uh, this is the results of our digital capabilities report, which, which we've been working on. Um, this is um, getting data from institutions nationally and I think there might be uh, plans to go internationally in the future just to see how um, people are teaching digital capabilities, if anybody has a strategy and so on um, and the results will be um, discussed and displayed and revealed and then the plan is that we will do every two years uh, just to compare. So, uh, so please book yourself a place. You'll see you've got an email there available to you to do that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again then. Okay. So thank you very much and have a good weekend. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye.